Kevin, we interviewed a number of businesses about how they use energy and the furniture maker in Queensland, uh, for them gas was a big issue. They used gas in their forklifts and when they set up a logbook system they found that one of them <coughs> was using a lot more gas than the others. And fixing this contributed to reducing their gas bill by about 75%. Uh, another business was surprised to find that their office heating and cooling was the big energy user, not their factory equipment. So Kevin, would you say it's always worth going back to basics and making sure you understand all the energy use in your business? Yes, Celeste. Uh, it's always worth a bit of research to find out the facts before going too far. This is why the skill sets make such a big thing about measuring energy use and where we can't measure it by using calculations to give us data on our energy use. We use energy all the time without giving it too much thought. This is okay, but it can get in the way of using energy more efficiently. We might think that that big noisy piece of equipment guzzles all the energy, but when we actually analyse where the energy is used, we, we often are surprised to find that a lot of the energy being used is just quietly slipping past our observation, but still costing us lots of money. We use energy in various ways. Um, so we might use it as light, we might use it as provide heating and air conditioning. Um, we might use it to provide motion, such as in the forklift truck shown here. Um, or we might um, use it for a whole range of things. So we've, you know, on screen now you can see a compressor which is using uh, electricity to, um, to make compressed air for the motor there. Uh, or we might be using it to, for a motor to drive a conveyor belt or a pump or many other ways of causing things to move. We use energy in a range of ways. And in a factory, we're using it to make things change. So we're trying to change location, moving things from A to B. Uh, we might be trying to change the shape of something, so we might bend it or stretch it or fold it or something like that. We might want to change the colour of it by painting it or coating it or otherwise colouring it. Or maybe we're just changing the form of it. We're melding it or undergoing some sort of chemical change. So these are fairly obvious places of where we're using energy. But we also use energy where the, the change isn't obvious and perhaps the, the work that's done is not obvious. Things like lighting, things like heating, cooling and ventilation, things like computers, computer screens, printers, modems, audio and video systems and so on. And these last are typical of office uses as well as being factory uses. So while energy is used in many different ways, we also buy it in different ways. Uh, you may remember talking about various forms of energy when you're at school. We get again, maybe you don't. Uh, energy can exist in many different forms. And if we're aware of the different forms of energy, we can examine our energy use much more critically and so make better decisions about how to use it more efficiently. One of the common forms in which we buy energy is electricity. Electricity is a very convenient form of using energy. It just comes down a wire to us. Uh, it's easily controlled. We just turn it on and off. And it's easily changed into other forms of energy such as light or heat or motion, i.e. we're putting it through an electric motor. These motors themselves are then typically used for running air conditioners or powering conveyor belts or turning pumps and, and turning fans, uh, driving compressors which in turn provide pneumatic power many other items of equipment. We also like electricity because it's clean to use, although not necessarily clean to generate. And while electricity is easily and conveniently creating light and motion, we never get 100% of the electricity converted into the forms we desire. Some of it is always ending up as heat. We might also buy our energy in the form of natural gas or LPG, uh, or liquid fuel such as petrol or diesel, or maybe even solid fuel such as coal. We're pretty familiar with uh, gas. We use gas as a reasonably convenient form. It just comes down a pipeline or out of a cylinder if we're using LPG. It's mainly used for heating uh, or as a vehicle fuel. Um, 
Space heating is a common application, heating up a factory, heating up an office, um, or heating up process ovens and furnaces. We often use gas in preference to electricity for these heating uses. And while most gas will burn and produce heat, not all of that heat will end up as useful heat in the product. Some of it will always be wasted. Likewise, using LPG as a fuel for forklift trucks and cars. Uh, the LPG is burned and, then, and so it expands a gas to drive the motor. But again, some of this energy potential of the gas is lost in waste heat. Waste heat. We also use liquid fuels as a source of energy, again, mainly for cars and trucks. And as with LPG powered vehicles, uh, the fuel's burned and some of the energy potential is wasted as heat. Some large energy users use coal, and this is burnt to provide heat energy. And typically, these are power stations or large boilers. And again, some of this energy potential is lost as waste heat. Most of us actually use coal indirectly because coal is the most common fuel used to generate electricity in Australia, and we use that electricity. So we buy energy as electricity or as a gas, liquid, or solid fuel, which we then turn into energy by burning it. So each business will have its own energy profile of the types of energy it uses and which are the big ticket items. Uh, Kevin, you mentioned transforming in electricity, typically into light, motion, or heat. Are there other ways that a business can make use of this principle? Well, yes, Celeste. As you notice, as we're talking about each form of energy, while we deliberately transform one form of energy into another, there's also an unwanted transformation which goes on at the same time. And this causes some of the energy to be wasted. Within the workplace, we mainly use energy to cause light, heat, or motion. So we buy a certain amount of energy. We have an input to the process of an amount of energy. And this is represented by that blue arrow on the slide. That energy gets used in the workplace. All the energy we put in is used, but not all of it is used usefully. Energy is never destroyed, just changes form. Similarly, energy is never created, even though it appears that we might be creating by unleashing the energy potential stored in a fuel. Now, if you want to get scientific about this, this is the first law of thermodynamics, which simply states that energy can be neither created nor destroyed. Within the workplace, we mainly use energy to cause light, heat, or motion, again, as shown on the slide. But much of the energy we use ends up as heat, whether that was the intended use or not. Energy easily changes from one form to another. Electricity will cause light or will cause motion, with waste energy appearing as waste heat. Fuels we burn for heat do deliver useful heat, but also produce heat which is not used in the process. Again, waste heat. Heat can be captured and reused in another way. Energy is never destroyed, it simply changes form. So we can reuse waste heat, but there are limitations. Energy only runs downhill, i.e. from a higher intensity source, high temperature, to a lower intensity form at a lower temperature. So we can use higher temperature energy source to hit a lower temperature energy use. We can reuse the waste heat with limitations. We can use the heat that's given out by a hot process or a light or a motor to heat a cooler area or process. But we can't use a cooler process to heat a hot one. Although I suppose if you want to put a heat pump into the system, that will allow us to make energy run uphill. Similarly, we can't use waste heat to make light very easily. So if energy is not created or destroyed, it goes somewhere. And you want to keep making that energy do work. Correct. If we're smart about this, we can capture and use a lot of this waste heat and so improve our energy efficiency. Much of the energy we use is not consumed by producing the change we want, the light, the temperature, or the motion. It doesn't get consumed in producing the product or in producing the service. We run electricity through our lights, and yes, they do produce light, but they also produce heat. Similar electric motors do produce motion but they also produce heat. This heat is wasted energy. And some of the energy we are buying is not being used to produce the required product or service. 
So, what we're after, of course, is to produce, is to use that energy more efficiently. And this energy that's not being used to produce the product we talk about as being waste energy or waste heat. To reduce the energy consumption, we can follow one of three main paths. We can use less energy to get the same result. We can use a greater proportion of it to produce the change we want, i.e. less waste and better energy efficiency. And we can capture the waste energy and use it constructively, i.e. energy reuse. Improving energy efficiency can be done through changing the energy consuming device to the variety which is more efficient, more efficient. Alternatively, maybe we can change the environment within which we're using energy so that less energy is wasted to that environment. Let's look at a couple of examples. Um, one, side, one side there, we might be changing using electric heaters to using reverse cycle air conditioning. This will provide the same amount of warmth, but much more efficiently. A classic example of changing device, and one we've probably all done some of, is with light globes. If we want to improve our energy efficiency, if we look at the old style incandescent light bulb, they produce some heat, some light, sorry, and a lot of heat. If we move to fluorescent light bulb, we're producing a lot of light and not much heat. If we move to LED lights, we produce very little heat and mainly light. So here, each time we have changed the device, we're producing less heat and using more of that energy to produce light. So our energy efficiency has gone up. Let's take an example of changing the environment. If we're trying to heat a building, we might decide to insulate the building or the equipment so they need less heating or less cooling. Or maybe we change our buildings to let in more sunlight or less sunlight so they require less heating or cooling or less artificial light. Or we might change the way we ventilate the building so that less air conditioning is needed. Or maybe we try to reduce the draft so that the air conditioning works more efficiently. Or if we go back to our lighting example, if we paint the walls and ceilings a light reflective colour, this will increase the amount of useful light there is in the room as less will be absorbed. Thanks, Kevin. I might just interrupt you here uh, because lighting and LED are interesting aspects of energy efficiency. So I wanted to do a quick poll. And this is looking at whether LED is always the best option. We can get some thoughts from people. Okay, we've got a lot of people saying it depends on what it's being used for. 20% uh, roughly saying it's always the best option because it uses the least energy and I think both of those are absolutely correct and number four as well, it depends on the track record of the light. I think that's the issue. Um, LED does use the least energy but what we've discovered from the interviews is that there are other issues that need to be factored in to the business decision. So for example, the reliability of the globes and how often they need to be replaced and the quality of light for the particular work task. We do have a video on this. So one of the energy efficiency videos is entitled Lighting and it does outline many of these issues about lighting and, and how the businesses went about evaluating the best option for their lighting. Okay, so we'll just move the technology along <laughs> to the right screen. Sorry, Kevin. That's all right. It's always good to have the right screen so I know what I'm talking about. The, the sort of changes we've just been talking about and some of the changes we're going to talk about today allow us to use our energy more efficiently. But before we get into that in more detail, let's have a look at this capturing of waste heat. Sometimes this requires us to think outside the box. To start with this, we need to answer a few basic questions. Um, so we start off by saying, what processes, what equipment do we have that are producing unneeded heat. And if we look critically at what's around us, we'll probably find most of our processes and equipment do produce unneeded heat. So the next question then is, well, at what temperature is that heat? 
Now, I'll hold back grabbing your thermometer and rushing out. At this stage, it's probably accurate enough to sort of say, well, it's pretty hot or it's warm or it's pretty cool. Because uh, we're really just trying to work out whether we've got enough heat there to, to flow downhill, as we were talking about. But what we also need to sort of say, what processes could use that heat? I, which processes are at a lower temperature and need heating? So answering these questions then gives us a starting point for reusing waste heat. Uh, we might need a bit more detail before we implement any proposed reuse of energy, but this gives us an idea of where to start. Kevin, we spoke to one business that was pumping hot air into the factory all year round until they realised that with some relatively simple changes they could use the heat to keep the place warm in winter. Yeah, look, this was a really uh, interesting one, Celeste. They, uh, they'd found they had this item of plant which they knew was generating a lot of waste heat and it was just being radiated out into the workplace. This was nice in winter, um, but it caused big cooling costs and a lot of discomfort in summer. Their first thought was a fairly simple one, let's put in a duct and we'll just duct this heat out through the roof into the outside. Then someone had a brainwave. Let's put in the duct, but let's also put a damper in that duct. So then summer, we open up the damper, we reject all the heat to the outside and so reduce our cooling costs. In winter, we just close the damper, direct all the heat into the workplace, so keeping the place warm and reducing our heating costs. Having done this, they discovered that ventilating the heat during summer not only got rid of the unwanted heat, but also improved the general ventilation of the workplace. It cost them a few dollars for the sheet metal ductwork and the associated fittings. But the heating and cooling cost savings more than paid for it. They also found, interesting, they had a spin-off benefit. The productivity increased due to the more comfortable working conditions. So this really is a type of energy trading uh, within the business, so capturing the heat and making use of it in another process. But energy trading can be applied in many ways and, and moves into another topic that we'll cover later on today in the energy trading segment.